Um, so welcome everyone to the panel discussion, Unveiling Earth Planetary Studies in the New Space Economy. Um, I'm Dr. Andrew Beck at Marietta College, but I think before we get into the questions, I'll have the uh, other two panelists introduce themselves. We have Dr. Assam Heggie at uh, USC in the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and Mark Russell, the founder and CEO of Hyperscience. Um, Assam, if you could start and just in your introduction, kind of give us a description of your job, your field, maybe your educational pathway, and um, your career path to where you got now. Okay, so um, uh, so my name is Isam Hegi. I am a scientist who looked to understand water on planet and in uh, in uh, in desert area. So my job is really how to find water and to build the spacecraft and the instruments that help us look for water on the surface and the subsurface of planet, and that's mostly using radar and and microwave technology just in a simple way because they are able to to go under the ground and to see beyond the surface uh, look for evidence for groundwater so uh, uh, I worked in two places I worked in USC the University of Southern California and the jet propulsion lab in the radar division and uh, in the microwave and radar division in in USC also in the School of Engineering and uh, in my job, again, as I mentioned, my job is to build the instruments that will help look for water on planets and icy moons or, uh, of Jupiters and comets and asteroids. Uh, I also worked uh, for eight years in Johnson Sp uh, uh, Space Center in Houston with the Astronaut Training Office and with the Lunar and Petri Institute. And my work was to help to guide uh, the astronauts used uh, radar instruments to look for ice on the surface of the moon. As for my background, I mean, I was born in Libya in the desert, and basically uh, I grew up in Libya for a part of my childhood, then we moved to Tunisia, then I moved to France for my study, and then I moved to Egypt for my university study, and then from that I moved to France. And uh, then I moved to the U.S. I'm a faculty in the, in the Institute of uh, Geophysics of uh, Paris in France. And um, I have to be honest that uh, when I was a student, I never thought any time of my life that I would be training the astronaut or building spacecraft to go on the moon, to the icy moon of Jupiter, to Mars. I've been involved with uh, several missions. Uh, with NASA and the European Space Agency, I worked on the uh, on the Mars Express mission, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, mission, the ExoMars mission, the Rosetta mission, the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter, uh, and worked in the formulation of the JUICE mission and Europa Clipper mission, um, and uh, and again. So it's not anything I would have guessed during my childhood. But um, but I think uh, I just I'm happy to be in this adventure. I'm happy to meet today the students and to talk with them to give them some information about space. Okay, thank you, and that's a very impressive and informational background. Thanks for that. Now I see Mark. We've changed our background. I, I see a image of asteroid psyche behind it. Yeah. Um, right. So. So I'll pass to you again, same thing, if you give us kind of a description of your job and how you got there and different educational things, your background. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, uh, my background's uh, aero-astro engineering. My uh, undergrad's from RPI in New York in aeronautical and, uh, engineering, and then I went on to Stanford, got my master's degree in aero-astro engineering, um, and uh, kind of worked my way from conventional aerospace, uh, working for Boeing uh, on airplanes, then later uh, a, a vehicle called Sea Launch. We launched uh, big rockets from a, a floating oil drill rig platform called Sea Launch out in the Pacific, uh, putting up like XM radio, big, big, big satellites, but always had a passion for uh, human spaceflight and, uh, you know, the how do the rest of us fly? And so uh, ultimately uh, worked 
worked for uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, employee number 10 at Blue Origin, and I led their first vertical takeoff and landing vehicle and then ran uh, crew capsule development for years and uh, really stepped away from conventional kind of big rockets and knowing that, look, I got this capsule, got to a point where it was built, big windows, abort systems. And I said, look, it's going to be another 10 years until rockets are ready to fly humans uh, re regularly like that. I was, I was a little wrong. It was about 14 years. And I am slated to be an astronaut on uh, the Blue Origin uh, vehicle uh, in the not too distant future. So big passion about human spaceflight, but uh, my whole family, I'm a third generation miner. All of us have been uh, developing uh, mines and mining technology. So I started a hypersonics company called Hypersciences, uh, worked with Shell and the Game Changers program, a great guy, Hani El Shahawi was our, our uh, sponsor, and we fire projectiles. We, we actually make our own little uh, meteors uh, and punch them into the ground. So the reason I have uh, these images in my back, I just gave a talk uh, on the, uh, the overlap of underground uh, mining and aerospace technologies and we are using uh, hypersonic impact to break rock underground faster. And we've uh, created a technology that's great for uh, replacing drill and blast underground. Uh, could be good for mining asteroids in the future, but right now we're tunneling uh, as the fastest tunnel boring machine in the world uh, for hard rock. But that same technology scales up for space flight. And so that's uh, that's been my mission is to develop technologies that can rapidly access resources both in the ground and out into space. So that's me. Great. Thanks. And I'll just give a brief uh, background of myself. So my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. Um, and then I went on to discover geology very, very late. We got a PhD in geology and did planetary science research at the Smithsonian, um, associated with some NASA missions there and doing meteorite research at the Smithsonian, part of the Antarctic Meteorite Research Program. And then I was at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab where we um, built spacecraft, uh, flew spacecraft, and then I would come in on the science end and try and interpret some of that data specifically what it meant to different geologic processes, um, a little bit different from Assam, not the volatiles, but more of the rock and mineral stuff is what I was focused on and using Visnier spectroscopy and then gamma ray and nuclear spectroscopy. And then currently I'm at Marietta College where I'm an associate professor and director of the geology program. And we've uh, recently introduced a planetary science major here as well. Um, so I guess how we will run this is all got a list of questions I'm going to be kind of pulling from, um, but we can kind of divert from that depending on how the discussion goes. If you do have questions in the audience that you'd like for us to uh, address, we'll save some time at the end and I will try and work those in. So if you want to put those in the chat or the Q&A, um, then we can try and get them into the latter part of the discussion. Looking over at my list of questions, I think one that kind of bleeds into both of your fields is uh, in situ resource utilization in space. For the uninitiated in the audience, that is mining for resources in space that we would then use to further um, enhance our exploration in space. And I think that the panelists um, kind of stretch across both those interests because there's one avenue that is looking at utilizing uh, water and different volatiles and one that might be looking at utilizing more hard rock material. So to the panelists, I guess I'll ask, where do you see resource utilization or resource <laughs> um, mining in space going in the next uh, 5, 10, and 20 years? So we'll start with um, Assam, if you would care to address that okay i th i think uh, the most precious resource we're looking at in space right now would be for the lunar mission it's it's the ice on the moon and the main reason for, for which we need ice on the moon is that we need to sustain a human base on the moon i think that that human base on the moon will replace in a partial way the international space station which become very expensive, which become complicated to uh, uh, operate. And also it depends in, in a way or another uh, uh, by the geopolitical 
context we are in. You need Russian rockets to reach it from time, you need international co collaboration in some cases. So a base on the moon will rely on easier, more sustainable way for human to be in space and um, from which they can do a lot of observation, which we cannot do from the Earth, like radio astronomy, like infrared astronomy, like uh, some of the experiments that are being made right now in the International Space Station. All of this can shift somehow, not all of it, a, a big part of it can shift to uh, a lunar base. And in order to, to live on the moon, we need water to, to generate, of course, the way to sustain humans, but also the way to sustain the fuel, to make fuel to go back to the Earth. So that's, I think, the first element. And then the second element I think we need to be able to look at uh, um, uh, on planetary uh, uh, object of the, of the solar system is a way to, to have uh, a methane that can help us also to go back from the far bodies we reach in the solar system. And, uh, uh, and, and here, when, when I speak about the methane, I'm talking about a way to make the, the propulsion go back to the Earth if we go to a far body in the solar system. So to me, these are the two most important resources. Is one resource help us to sustain the life uh, of humans in, uh, in the base in these places. But, and when the second one of them is to be able to help us to go back from these bodies we explore. Okay, thank. And I would, I just if I could chime in, I was under the impression that water could also, through hydrolysis, you could get the hydrogen out of it and use the hydrogen for fuel. Were you saying that the methane would be used for fuel instead of the hydrogen from the water that's mined? It is true that you can use the hydrogen from the water, and that in that case, the moon is easy because it's not a far away from us. So the amount of hydrogen we, we, we generate by these processes can help us to get enough energy to leave the gravity of the moon and to come back. But if we leave to a far a more further body of the, of the solar system, we might need more than just the hydrogen. And, and if we have access to methane, that would be great. Okay. And then, uh, Mark, I guess to you, where yeah. do you see and maybe your mining experience on Earth or in other avenues, do you see resource utilization in space going in the next decade or so? Yeah, I think I think the time frame's a, a good one to start with because it really depends what you're trying to accomplish. I think I'll echo a few things Esam said, um, and I'll put it in terms of exploration. In the next 10 years, we want to go to Mars. We want to be have an established uh, presence on the moon. That generally means uh, from a propulsion standpoint, you're going to need chemical rockets. I think in the future, beyond the next 10 years, you're going to see nuclear rockets or you know, if we can figure out fusion, but nuclear are the improvements to the, what they call ISP specific impulse are so much better with different types of propulsion than just chemical. But for the next decade or two, you're looking at uh, the cis lunar economy needing, um, or at least, you know, endeavors needing hydrogen, oxygen. Um, if you read uh, Robert Zubrin's book, uh, The Case for Mars, you'll find that in situ propellant manufacturer, um, uh, using the CO2 in the atmosphere, delivering hydrogen as a feedstock to, or using the water uh, on uh, Mars as a feedstock is a fantastic way. So if you look at all the great explorations that were done uh, to you know, go to the poles, um, the most successful missions are the ones that are utilizing um, as much material, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the, you know, the resources that are right there rather than bringing everything with you. And so in the next 10 years, I think ice, I think that will be a piece of the key resource from lunar um, because right now it's expensive to launch things to space. It's, it's you know, everybody thinks Starship's going to solve uh, a lot of problems and they'll deliver cargo. But if you look at the number of times Starship has to fuel, refuel in order to land on the moon and do something with that, cargo capacity, I think they say you, that thing needs to refuel like 
a dozen times before it can actually go and do its whole mission uh, on the moon. So there's a lot of flights and a lot of fuel. So I think depoting resources in low Earth orbit uh, is going to be a key part using as much of those resources from Earth and um, materials. I think when you deliver materials uh, either uh, from the lunar um, out to cislunar orbit uh, from the moon, I think those are going to be resources that you can 3D print into things uh, and create fabricate, you know, fabricate those tabs and modules that you're going to use for um, uh, for the exploration. So for the next 10 years, we're looking exploration. We're not quite ready to settle for the, probably the next 20 or 30 years. And then we're going to talk about actually establishing civilizations over decades, um, if not centuries. So minerals right now, I think water and you're thinking materials that you can 3D print with. I think those are you come from Earth, deliver them cheaply. So my company, actually, I have, a, I have a separate company called Pipeline to Space, and that's our goal is to lower the cost of access to space. Uh, Hypersciences builds these accelerators that go up and into the ground. But I think those are your two kind of key resources that you're going to need in uh, cislunar um, development. And so if we project beyond 10 years, do you... Do you all think it will ever be economically viable to, for example, go to um, asteroids that might be more metallic um, and try and get some of those resources? They can contain gold and platinum group elements. They're on the PPM level, but uh, will things ever evolve to um, mining things to bring back to Earth, or is that just completely economically unviable, even into the distant future? Oh, I, if you let me, uh, I'll jump in and just say, sure. I think, I think we don't know, but we do know resources that are out on asteroids are already have the energy, you know, they need out in orbit. So you don't have to necessarily bring them from earth and out of the gravity. Well, so it becomes a cost. Uh, and what do you want to do out there? You can actually use those materials and actually there, there's all sorts of concepts for boring through them and using them as habs themselves. So it's uh, it's not completely clear that it, it wouldn't be. Uh, Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos calls uh, you know the future a uh, place where Earth is you know, zoned light industrial, and the rest of heavy industry is off planet. Um, that's a that's a big you know big broad future. Uh, I think in centuries from now, I think that's true. I think in the next hundred years, I think there's going to be a lot of resources from Earth required out, but. Uh, no, I wouldn't put it out. Human beings are incredibly um, ingenious when it comes to utilizing resources, but uh, that's that's my opinion. I'm bullish. Okay. Assam, did you have anything to add about projecting and further and doing things beyond water and methane? Well, I well I think the idea of uh, mining space, I mean, um, uh, it's natural continuity of us thinking that every new place can be mined in the same way that the west of the United States was was inhabited by mining and flourished by mining industry. And so if you go to a new place, then the first benefit, financial benefit we get out of it is to mine it. And I think the first financial benefit we get from going to new places is understand how fragile is our own planet and how these new places we go to mine they control the uh, the life, the fate of our life. Well, for instance, the asteroids, uh, they 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 were able to extinguish the dinosaur. Now, I mean, I know that this might seem romantic, but dinosaurs were bigger, much larger population than humans, maybe, and they, yet they did disappear because of their lack of adaptation to the the climate made by this impact. So I think the most precious thing here is to get even few the samples of these worlds, the new worlds we explore, not to mine them, to mine them, to sell them on eBay maybe, but 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 really to 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 use them in the lab to learn about the formation of these bodies and how they can collide with our own and the damages that this may cause to our own planet. Now, something very important to keep in mind that the asteroids and the comets and the small bodies which enter the gravity of the Earth, we see these by mostly by radars when they are very close to the Earth. And we have we need to build 
And by the time you see it, so if we see that an, an asteroids will, will, will collide with us in a month, or let's say even in six months, I believe it's too late for us to set something to encounter that at this stage. So instead of thinking how we can mine these objects, I think how we can intercept these objects first, at first place in a quick way. If they come to, to, to rendezvous with us, yeah, thank like you. That. And if if I could, uh, I guess I'll wave the flag for a previous institution, the dual asteroid redirect mission. There was a T in there. It's called DART from NASA. Dart, APL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. DART's amazing. Used, yeah, used uh, one asteroid to fling into another to get it off course. So there is advances in that. And yeah, I agree. It's uh, very, very important. Um, I'm going to kind of pivot to something we had graze on a little bit the increase in uh, the private sector in space exploration. So we've seen with things like Blue Origin and SpaceX and others, uh, a large increase in, in private sector involvement over the past 10, 15 years. And I was wondering what you think some of the pros and cons of that shift is and how you seeing it playing out in the future. Maybe specifically, do you think there'll be many, many different companies do this doing this or it'll kind of consolidate into a few major ones uh asam you go ahead and start if you've got anything or okay yeah so uh, i think the future of space belongs to private companies and i say that by even by working with a, with the federal funding and why and why why i believe that because there are a lot of limitations of 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 uh, of space agencies to tackle the new challenges of our planet. Let me give you an example. If we build, if NASA is establishing a mission or the European Space Agency fabricate a mission, it is mostly looking to address science questions that are relevant to the US or to Europe. But unfortunately, most of the biggest science questions today on climate change, desertification, Hydroclimatic extremes, like the floods we see in Libya, Saudi Arabia, in, uh, and the fires we see in places in Africa, in South America, all of these remains below the interest or below the instrument development of government space agency, which logically have to tackle its own objective. Now, who can step in to fill this gap for these developing nations? I think the private sector is here very crucial because it can step in to help these nations with feasible observations and missions to mitigate these natural and climatic hazards that are uh, multipl mult multiplying in areas where previously there was no population, but today there is population and it's a developing nation and they don't have a space program. So, for instance, we see new companies, and I give you one example like Maxar, the very famous company that's, that, that do optical images, uh, 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 ISAT, Pinsat in Finland, and there is even new uh, spin-off that work on hyperspectral uh, uh, imaging uh, using a small model of the hyperspectral observation by ISRO. And these are ready to provide the service to the clients they needed without looking to any political agenda. And this is very important in the world we live in. Thank you. And uh, Mark, to you, how do you see the uh, development of the private sector in space exploration having positive and perhaps if there are any negative impacts and um, how do you see it playing out in the future? Oh, I am so bullish about the, uh, the uh, the commercial sector, um, the, I think the, from here to, to you know, we'll call it lunar. I think that is going to be incredible commercial enterprise. I think you get outside of our, um, you know, Earth's sphere of gravity and into Mars. I think you're going to see the big companies like SpaceX, uh, and of course, Blue Origin and others that are going to get 
large dollars for the big missions uh, that participate with NASA. And there's a certain level of complexity when you're using uh, government dollars, you you have to execute pretty much flawlessly. Uh, and they're going to, uh, you know, SpaceX is going to, um, you know, do some amazing things, I think, on the Martian front. And I think Blue Origin and others will do great things for, for Earth uh, to assist lunar. But near Earth orbit, I think, and, um, and again, cis lunar, you see Right now, there's a really neat, interesting dynamic. I, I just did a talk on space and mining uh, to uh, University of British Columbia, uh, hosted a space and mining event last week. And, you know, you look at these companies that are private companies, but Australia is buying a rover from them and putting it on the moon. I mean, so now countries can have actually pretty small budgets and put their flag on the moon. <laughs> and so it's great. So this interaction of private um to public dollars, you see, you see Blue Origins doing it. They're matching funds to the federal government. Uh, SpaceX has been taking money since do day one uh, for these big endeavors, and so there's this entire economy. Imagine if you figured out after Starbucks that everybody was willing to pay five dollars uh, for a cup of coffee. There's a lot of small brewery coffee breweries that came up, and so have made you know this amazing economy. Same thing. So you look at at all these. Um, other commercial analogies, uh, I think I think it's it's the Wild West, and it's pretty awesome. Um, I'm doing it. I'm doing. I actually used an aerospace tech on leaving Blue Origin. I had this idea that we could launch from underground to fly to space, and so for a decade, I funded the University of Washington lab. They have a really cool technology called Ram Accelerator. It's a hypervelocity system, and so again, using research that was done, paid for by the government, and then beginning to commercialize it, I think it, it's just the natural fit for us to, you know, hand off the baton where the researchers have gotten to a certain point, and then you're on to commercialize. I My companies wouldn't really exist without how these researchers like you, Andrew, and some uh, developing these things decades earlier, and then everything goes sort of non-linear once you, you put enough capital into them. So um, I think it's, uh, I think it's an amazing um, time. We are you know, we're going to have multiple equivalent moon landings within our lifetime because of this. And we can, you know, I live in a time I got to work on something where I can buy a ticket to space now. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's phenomenal. And I want to change the world for human access to space, which is why I started again, pipeline to space. And you can see how that's uh, developing. It's pretty exciting. And um, I think you had mentioned that before, a pipeline to space. Would you mind describing that a little bit more for me? I was, didn't maybe catch all of that. Yeah, sure. I, I'd play a video if you wanted. I, it takes about a minute, but uh, you, let, you let me know. Uh, ultimately, we're, we're creating um, an on-demand um, launch service that delivers payloads. You know, right now we're offering 200 kilogram per launch, and it's um, daily regular flights and what we did is we got rid of the big first stage booster we have an in-tube accelerator it's a one part moving jet engine uh there's no really moving parts it sets up and it rides this projectile rides on a shock wave in this tube and it exits at about one third orbital velocity and then you have a really small upper stage that puts it into orbit so we're able to recycle that system um very very rapidly we use that a smaller version of that exact system and we launch every 30 seconds today. And that's what we, we shoot these projectiles that we mine with. So we got very good at loading and firing uh, at these high speeds. We knew we needed to go and uh, dominate the underground uh, kind of capability. And now we're able to exit into the atmosphere. So we've been down to Spaceport America and launched there. We are poised to set a world's record for the number of times we fly to space uh, with pipeline to space. So it's uh, it's an exciting time. But uh, again, just a chemical um, two, uh, you know, gas, uh, a compressed air, natural gas, compressed air, hydrogen, very clean fuels that get rid of this big first stage booster. And we fly what you really want to fly, which is your payload uh, into orbit. And, uh, and then you recover cover and recycle the system um, about every 30 minutes. So multiple versions of that around the world off of drill rigs uh, or barges and, uh, and in the ground. And we see that as a network that radically changes access. You don't have to wait for a SpaceX to finally take your payload to hope that it's going to get in an orbit.
that you really want. You get it when you want. And uh, we're actually going live with a crowdfund um, in two weeks. Uh, so anyone can invest in my company. You can't invest in Blue, or, you know, Blue Origin or SpaceX, but you can invest in my two companies. Thanks. Um, this is going a little bit off script, but something I just right. kind of thought of when you were describing that. Uh, first, I'm going to start it with a short question. Uh, Asam, when you were describing the things you do, you said, I build instruments, I, I do this. Are you a, more of an engineer or more of a scientist or kind of both? That is a good question. So I'm actually both. So for instance, uh, so for instance, I am a social professor of uh, geophysics in the Geoscience Institute in Paris. And uh, I, I, and I am, uh, and I am, I am a research faculty in the electrical and computer engineering department of USC. And I was uh, a, a research faculty in Caltech in the geology department. And a researcher, and uh, and I am a scientist in the in, uh, radar science and engineering in JPL. So it's basically between the two worlds, between science and engineering. What I love about uh, JPL, what I love about my work, that you do everything from end to end. We start with the mission on the napkins, uh, a draw uh, on a paper, to the to the design, to the performance study, to the to the fabrication of the mission to the launch, to the operation, to data analysis, to publication. And I've done from these missions end to end, which the mission was did not exist. I mean, I followed the work from end to end on four occasions. And I'm now the PI of one, it's a NASA mission concept. We look for groundwater and understand sea level rise on Earth uh, using a sounding radar. And uh, it's really a very enriching experience to be between the two worlds. And actually, space is one of the rare disciplines where the barriers between these two can change. You see engineers doing science and scientists do, do, doing uh, engineering and vice versa. Uh, yeah, so that was a kind of the reason I brought that up was it sounds like, and I think I'm right, Mark, you're very firmly an engineer, correct? <laughs> Yeah, I spent a lot of time raising money, but uh, yeah, I spend uh, a great deal of my time uh, with uh, direction of the architecture of the systems. But if you don't have those technical insights, uh, it's hard to make those jumps if you're pure business. So sure. uh, if you ever read how Google works, the first 20 pages, the rest isn't probably worth it, but read that first 20 pages. Just If you want to know how things work, ask your engineers, have that insight, and, uh, and they'll always... Uh, impress you with uh, how you can see the world a brand new way right i but what i'm getting at is so i'm a scientist i am in no way an engineer <laughs> like when you're describing the different things of building i just my interest is in the why it's there let me understand the science behind it mark do you work with scientists in your field a lot and if so could you describe how you work with maybe geoscientists or more people oh, that are science yeah. oriented for sure. So uh, it kind of spans the, the gamut. So on my mining side, we work with geologists, uh, geophysicists. Um, so when we fire projectiles at the rock, uh, we get acoustics. So uh, it's a really low impulse uh, to, so for instance, we could tunnel uh, five feet away from, uh, you know, a Brooklyn coffee stand uh, because we don't let off all of our explosive at once, like drilling and blasting. So you get these small pings. What we did is we put geophones around our test site and we're able to actually look uh, and look at all of the rock uh, and resources around us. So we use geophysicists. Um, we, um, for instance, the technology for modeling the combustion as well as uh, the impact. We use a group out of Southwest Research, uh, a bunch of research scientists in um, shock mechanics. Um, in fact, one of uh, Yogandra Gupta, who runs the WSU, WSU Washington State University uh, Shock Physics Lab, uh, they do high strain rate physics. And you'd think all this stuff is just very, uh, you know, arcane scientific, but it, it pulls into the data sets we use. And so we're able to predict the, the effects of hypersonic impact where you're almost going supersonic in the rock sound speed. So there's a lot of interesting physics uh, that goes on. We fund the University of Washington lab that does the fundamental physics of RAM accelerator and they're brilliant and they've delivered some things 
that um, are uh, are really game changing for access to this hyper velocity. So yeah, I, I would just say we uh, kind of the gamut. And if we didn't have them, uh, having done that for decades before, again, they allow us to have that great technical base, and then we just yeah engineer the solutions that that architecturally work for um, you know the economy we're trying we're trying to to intercept. Um, and one thing that I had kind of come up with when you when I had looked at a little bit about your stuff online, you had mentioned this before. You're shooting small projectiles at hyper velocities to do mining. What is the composition of those projectiles? Maybe you're not allowed to say. I don't know if they're proprietary or not. But no, and how did really you come simple. up with that? <laughs> they're made out of concrete. <laughs> okay. So when uh, it's really about a cost value. When you're underground mining, you want. Uh, you want to be competitive with today's existing te technology, which is pretty Neanderthal. You have a couple of people underground drilling, and then you load the explosive, you run away, you ignite, it blows up, you wait to invent. So it's a very sequential, old-fashioned process. What we do is we change all that. We just individually, with multiple barrels, we're shooting every few seconds. And so you, the rate at which you're firing, it's just using, in fact... Uh, clean hydrogen and air and breaking that rock is uh, super inexpensive. So we use um, a lot of, you know, physics to understand how the rock might break, but ultimately it's just, it's just low cost concrete. Uh, when you're flying to space, uh, that's a different problem. Um, we flip the problem on end normally in space flight where these big, huge rockets, they're made out of very expensive carbon fiber or, you know, um, you know, we, uh, a very exotic aluminum and, and complex propellants, uh, cryogens. What we do is we make our projectiles actually out of steel, very, very heavy and very uh, inexpensive. Because we put the energy into it underground, super inexpensive. And so again, our passion here is flight rate, flight rate, flight rate underground using inexpensive propellants into space using inexpensive. And in fact, uh, if we make them out of nickel and put them in orbit, now we depot that and you can start 3D printing nickel. So someone asks in here, what are the important materials? Uh, having metals that uh, you can print and use in space, I think are, are critical and, and just make it inexpensive. So we can talk all day long about my projectiles <laughs> because it's inexpensive. Um, yeah. And uh, it's made from the original accretion of this planet from, uh, you know, nickel and iron. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, we can get it off planet. Great if we can take it uh, from our planet and put it back into the sky. That's pretty yeah. exciting too. Yeah, there's a lot more iron nickel floating around in space than we've got <laughs> yeah. in rocks yeah. on Earth. You got to yeah. go find take solar energy, powder, powderize it, and you can now 3D print an entire vehicle in a hab uh, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of pivot to another question I had concerning, and we kind of touched on this. Um, Assam, you had mentioned it at one point, but the developing interest of uh, planetary exploration and planetary science in developing countries. It used to be that, you know, it was NASA and uh, back in the day, USSR, there were the space programs, and then NASA and the European Space Agency, but recently, and JAXA, but recently a lot of more developing countries have gotten involved in space exploration and planetary science. And this kind of dovetails into one of the Q&A questions about how can students that might be in some of those countries get into this field or what sort of educational pathways, if they want to do some of the stuff that you all do, would you recommend for them? If Assam, if you wanted to start with that. So, yes, I agree with you that developing nations are today uh, have a lot of needs to be in space and space is is a necessity for every society it's an it's an obvious necessity when it comes to things like uh, communication system positioning systems but it is less of a necessity it is less understood as a necessity when it comes to resolve issues related to resource management like water to understand the risks of, of uh, the climatic risks, uh, uh, like the storms, the hurricanes, sea level rise. So, and, and that is quite uh, 
that's where developing nations are trying to get to, is to use space technology to mitigate risks or water resources or agricultural resources issue they have. And I know that, that this might be a uh, look for many people, they, they can say, okay, why they don't need the data that is available online. Well, because the data that is available online may or may not uh, respond to all the needs which they have in terms of resolution, in terms of the frequency of the, uh, of the acquisition, in terms of the sensor being used uh, uh, on this platform. So that's where, where I think a lot uh, of the interest by developing nations uh, in space. Now, the students from developing nations are also interested in space. And a lot of them, like me, will come uh, to study in Europe or in the US with the objective of developing or new technologies to make space exploration more affordable, which is exactly what Mark is working on. So I believe that the private sector and the developing nation both have the same objective, which to make space exploration accessible to a larger group of people. And that's where I see that there could be more leverage in the future and more students in the future working or making an, an uh, internship in the in the private sector at the same the same objective. And as they don't have the issues with ITAR and all of that, I mean not so not so strong as you can find it in the federal lab. And I think every discipline can lead you to space. Geology, geophysics, remote sensing, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, even accounting. I don't know a single discipline that you can learn in a technical university in engineering or science that is not useful in space. Thanks. And Mark, um, to you, how could students in developing countries um, really get to a path like you did and what recommendations would you have for them? Uh, sure. I, I think there's a couple key ones. Uh, we have a project, for instance, um, in Asia. Uh, it's uh, it's actually in Sri Lanka. And it's, uh, it's a developing country um, that has incredible resources. So what I would say is if you're a, uh, a student, um, I would spend some time learning uh, AI. I think AI and uh, machine learning in using data sets from space, such as, like uh, Isam said, uh, water resources, actually mineral resources. Look, each one of these countries now basically can dig through uh, 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 an incredible database that each country has a geological survey. They actually have entire water resource studies. Um, and mm -hmm. if if you want to if you want to develop, um, you know, an incredible standard of living. Start looking what you have for your, in your resources underground. Hypersciences, funded by Shell, Exxon, and some other major companies, we used our technology uh, for five years to learn how to fly fast, actually underground in a small drilling situation where we could get access geothermal. There is geothermal everywhere on this planet. You go five kilometers, it's 25 degrees C per kilometer. If we can crack that cost of drilling for geothermal energy and crack the where is my water resources clean fresh water underground and use data sets that were developed by first world countries that are have all these incredible uh, resources you have access to them so learn how to program learn how to do ai uh, and apply it to the resources you have and use space-based resources to inform those decisions that'd be great if you want to become an astronaut you know, and you want to uh, explore space, then, you know, each country is going to have to, you know, smaller countries, you're going to have to go find uh, a group that has the resources to uh, work, uh, to develop that, maybe, you know, going to the European groups. Um, India has an incredible space program. So it really depends on what your passion is. But if you're, uh, you want to use space-based uh, resource, I would start with AI and uh, learn how to program. I write code all the time. I'm a CEO, I'm a business guy, and I probably write code one day out of my week because 
I let the machines help me decide and make um, great informed decisions from, you know, reasonably um, decent sized data sets. So let the machines help you. And I think you're going to have a great mm -hmm. partnership. You're leveling the field across the world with machine learning and AI. Um, and I'll just add in my two cents. Um, I, I think the most important field, if you're wanting to understand how the things in outer space formed or go there and, and do science on them is geoscience. Um, I think that there is really something intangible that comes from learning a field when your brain is still developing. And I'm saying that because if, if you went to college and learned all physics and math, and then when you're in your late twenties, say, I'll go back and learn geology. I think it's, it's really important if you do that first and make that your intellectual bones, and then you really have it inside of you that when you go to these other things, you understand them on a whole other level. And I say that because in working with, um, various NASA missions at the Applied Physics Lab and other places, there's a lot of people that come into planetary science that are pure physics, and then they learn some geology later on. And they certainly have things that they can add to um, uh, the intellectual conversation, but I think really knowing that geology first and having that your primary thing gives a big leg up when it comes to interpreting some of that data stuff, so... I'll get off my soapbox on geology now and, and maybe move on unless anyone had anything to add on that. Okay. No, I think, um, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Andrew, I just want to say on that. Uh, I mean, I have the same experiences working on missions and these missions, they tend to have bigger teams and larger teams. So there's always the collision between scientists and engineering and the discipline. And I think for those who want to work in space, the key things is to diversify your experience. Work as a geologist, work as an electrical engineer, work as a computer scientist. From the age to 20 to 45, I would think this is a great age for people to try everything. And let's say from 20 to 40, okay? Try everything, be everything. Anything that adds up to your experience from 40 to above, it will help a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, kind of on a, a sub question of the last one, talking about um, the advancement of space exploration in developing countries. Do you think that those space programs have any advantages over the space programs that are in the um, more tr traditional space exploration countries? Like, is there anything that they can do? do or hurdles that they don't have to overcome that gives them an advantage um anyone feel free to jump in if you've got an idea on that so i i can start because i work a lot with with uh, developing nations that are trying to jump into space and one that uh, the best example which is not to anymore i would say developing nation is india and china but ISRO is an example of, ISRO today is a robust space agency. It, it has a four launch facility. It launched more than 300 satellites in space. It have nine launch vehicle that was able to land a vehicle on the moon for 75 million dollars. And the way, I mean, I think the big difference between developing nations in space and developed one is that developing nations are try exactly to do what the private sector in the U.S. is to do, is make useful mission more cheaper and more affordable to address more science question and make space the national dream so that we can empower the next generation for science and, and, and education. And that's what India is doing, uh, but I would, uh, and, and China too, and both of these are not really the developing nations anymore, but that's what, what also other developing nations are following their path in uh, space research. I, I, I would say we can see that in the UAE, in the Emirates, we can see that in Saudi Arabia, we can see that in South Africa, in Algeria, in Morocco, um, 
in Brazil, Argentina, so which have a very good space program with the mission Aquarius that launched uh, with NASA. And so, and I think we should encourage these. We should encourage these initiatives. We should not link space to glory. We should not link space to I am the best. We should link space to address human questions. And that's why I believe the private sector and the international agencies are more and more helping us to go through that objective. And uh, Mark, over to you. Did you have anything to add on the question? Are there any advantages that developing nations who are um, trying to get into the space program might have? Uh, yeah, no, I would say. Um, so I got I got asked a really interesting question when I was one of the early um, uh, engineers at uh, Blue Origin. In fact, uh, the former chief counsel of, of Amazon was there and he comes over to my desk and asks me, he's like, how are we going to be different? Don't just tell me we're going to innovate. And I just said, the most important thing you can do is not overspend. Uh, um, you know, Bezos is, is a, was at the time nearly the richest man in the world. And I just said, look, we're going to innovate, but if you restrict, um, you know, your solutions to things that are economically sensible, then you're actually going to revolutionize what you're doing. So I think developing countries have something, the, um, the already developed space, uh, they don't have this uh, massive burden of, of infrastructure that they have to maintain. They get to start again. And in fact, just like, you know, look at Africa, you jump straight to a cellular revolution. You did not have to go through a wired. Uh, so you get to build CubeSats. And in fact, when I was at Stanford, we, uh, Bob Twiggs, my professor, designed the CubeSat standard. And now he went to Moorhead, uh, state in Kentucky, and he created the pocket CubeSat standard. So now you're sending pocket CubeSats to the moon on rovers. So I think developing nations ha do not have the burden of all this infrastructure that they have to maintain. They get to rethink the whole problem and use the latest technology. So I think there's advantage to not having um, so much resource that you're supposed to do it in a certain way, and there becomes this huge moat around it. Uh, SpaceX is a great example of eventually they're just building the biggest things possible because the rocket equation says build bigger and you get more efficient. That's actually not true. Fly more, more often. You do not send a FedEx package on a uh, barge uh, across the uh, Pacific or the Atlantic. What you do is you put it on a jet airplane and it gets there tomorrow because that's what's efficient. So anyway... I think I think developing nations can look at efficiency. I think if I were a student, again, with AI, I'd also go look, if you want to get into satellites, I'd go straight into CubeSats and pocket CubeSats, and I'd get my stuff flying as soon as I could with whatever country is going to fly you because they'll fly any university can get a flight today. Um, darn near. Uh, it may take you some time. And in the future, when Pipeline to Space comes, you can have it as soon as you're ready. You can, we'll fly you. Okay, I've got a couple more here before we go to the Q&A. Um, one thing I had, had thought of asking was, are there any subfields or research, research topics in either Earth science or mining on Earth or planetary science, since that's kind of what we're talking about here, or planetary exploration, subfields that maybe we haven't talked about that you think will become very important in the next decade or so? Um, so go ahead. I can say, so I can say from science perspective, uh, from engineering perspective. So I can say from the science perspective. Sure, both if you if you yeah. have got them yeah. both. So from the science per, uh, perspective, uh, the the I think uh, data science in environment and climate research will become a very important job. Uh, as we get more data and as we now have more climatic extreme happening everywhere around the globe and and the models forecast that these will increase uh, so the biggest flood the biggest casualties in the flood we have in the last 50 years wasn't in the amazon or uh, somewhere in northern europe due to ice melting it was in the sahara of libya just a month ago where 10,000 people died in a couple of hours by a massive mud flow. And so the field of natural hazards and how we monitor and forecast and model these natural hazards with data science 
I think will become more, more important. So uh, data mining and modeling uh, in environmental and climate research, well, I think would become, it's, it's a growing field. And it's a field also that will, will be able to regulate disputes between nations on water issues that, that go for transboundary uh, uh, groundwater or transboundary heaven. All the dispute can be resolved with advanced modeling, advancing uh, data analysis. I think this is what one of the fields that will be more and more needed in the future of data analysis in space. Thanks. And um, Mark, is there anything, a field in a, either a topic we've directly talked about or a tangential field that you think yeah. is going to be very important in the near future that we haven't discussed? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's three, but I'll start with one I think <laughs> is amazing. It's um, so using muon detection underground for finding mineral deposits using x-rays from cosmic sources it basically allows you to have effectively a tricorder under you put a, a receiver underground and you can over time uh delineate an entire ore body by just passive radiation from cosmic rays i think that technology um the more closer we get to miniaturized becomes a game changer for resources again i think back to the developing world needs to know where its resources are i Totally echo Assam's uh, opinion about water resources, understanding um, the surface as well as the underground flow of clean water, as well as the potential uh, flooding issues. That is definitely an orbital science type problem. You can use data science and get a much better idea of the risks and where your clean water is flowing and how to uh, to do that. And then thermal, I think being able to use seismic, for instance, underground for us, for geothermal, I think it's a, it's a game changer as well as for other natural resources. So, uh, muon detection underground, cosmic rays, water, and, uh, geothermal resources. And with the cosmic rays, at what depth do they stop penetrating the surface? Like, is this only useful at a shallow depth or can you go way down? I, you know, I'm not an expert at it. My understand is that um, these, uh, it, it is a very deep penetrating um, and it's, it's catching these uh, particles. And it's a, it's a, again, it's an area that I've heard a couple of talks. Uh, I think it would be if it ends up doing what they have demonstrated in a few key projects. So they, what they've done is they've gone underground in mines that they already know what the resource is. And they've stuck the machines down there and that has been able to do an a b map between the two the real the next question is okay go to a completely virgin site and then you know drill the hole stick it in and wait for it to acquire and i think that's uh i think that's an interesting piece of physics that uh is going on and could totally revolutionize um geoscience particularly resources in uh developing countries uh, and i guess i'll answer my own question as well and this is maybe low-hanging fruit um it's a bit broader but critical minerals and specifically minerals that contain elements that are going to be useful in batteries or even nuclear reactors because i think that um the united states and the rest of the world is going to have to go nuclear at some point if we're going to stop using fossil fuels so I think the geoscience fields that are aimed at locating and mining those specific minerals out, I'm not talking about just iron ore and that sort of thing. I'm talking about like lithium and other uh, uh, things using batteries and then radioactive sources for reactors. I think that will be a very, very hot topic uh, in the next decade. Um, totally agree. 100%. I couldn't yeah. say it better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of another question that was tangentially related to one that showed up in the Q&A, and we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, uh, yeah. A lot of times folks, uh, at least I'm familiar with, have thought, well, that's great. You're flying to the moon or Mars. What does that do for us on Earth sort of thing? Are there any ways that you can relate advances and maybe uh, fields of research you've done with for Assam 
um, locating volatiles on other surfaces or using geophysics on other surfaces or mark some of the uh, planetary space lights space flight stuff you've done to benefits to folks here on earth yeah well, i can um, start to... yeah go ahead Assam. i'll listen to you first i've got <laughs> no problem ideas. About things. so i think i i hear this thing many times it's everywhere that uh, space is not a necessity and i think we live in the age where 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 people take for granted the technology that we have and the development that we have and the prosperity we live in so i live in california and people take that for granted that everything can continue to be much better phones can be faster tvs can be bigger without just worrying about it and and i think from my egyptian background i want to tell these people uh, that egyptian civilization it lasted for seven thousand years and collapsed only by 20 years of wrong rule which were made by the last queen, which is Cleopatra. I won't dive into these rules, but enough 20 years of laxism and nationalism, and people say we've done everything to collapse 7,000 years of civilization. But when it comes to space, it's exactly the same thing. This is not a luxury. We can't understand how our planet evolved without studying the sister planets of our planets. So you can't understand how, uh, say, Japanese people are if we just know one Japanese person, you need to more, to, need to, to to see other people, and then you will have a global idea about the culture, uh, I mean, the tradition, and all of that. It's the same thing here. Looking to our planet just underneath our foot and claiming that this will help us understand global phenomena, it's illusion. Reality is not what we see. Reality is what we have to explore, and that's what space research is all about. And Mark, did you have uh, some to add to that? Yeah, I think there's there are two things. One, um, if we solve fusion and we need helium-3, uh, the lunar surface is an amazing source of helium-3 thanks to the solar wind. So, uh, two, I think that humans leave. We need, uh, we are going to go beyond Earth. Uh, of course, we're going to spend some time in Earth's uh, low Earth orbit in, you know, we'll call it O'Neillian. Uh, but in terms of the right here and now, um, we invent technologies to solve these complex problems, and then we bring those technologies back to Earth. Uh, NASA did it, and we have so many uh, benefits uh, by the development of those technologies. Even things like gaming, um, you look at, um, you get complaints that only wealthy people can fly to space now. Maybe that's true for now. But uh, there's those of us working, so the rest of us get to go. And um, when those things become available, there's all this other value that comes along with it. If gamers weren't demanding better and better processors, we probably would be delayed on AI. Um, and so AI is going to help solve some serious problems in our time. Um, so you can't always say that you know there's a specific deliverable from the moon other than helium-3 when we saw fusion um, that I can predict, I can tell you that there's a destination that people will go to. We call the moon. You'll look up in the sky and it's inspiration. And I think it's technology. And I think that's a great place to start. And um, I'll just chime in with uh, a science sided response. Um, it explains the ultimate question why we're here. For example, um, we are currently looking for evidence of life on Mars. And if life existed there, it was a very small window of time when there was water. If we can find a similarity to the evolutionary path of life on Mars to us, that will give us a very good indication of how life originated on these planets, which is, I think, the ultimate question that needs answered at some point is where it all came from. So I think that would be a a huge benefit from planetary science uh, research and exploration. Um, I'm going to take one from the Q&A that I think uh, is probably geared towards Assam. Um, it says, how is an Egyptian graduate student in the field of earth science, could I get free or funded uh, training to visit NASA? So I guess it's as an Egyptian graduate student in earth science, how can they get involved in NASA related things? Yes, that's a good question. Actually, I was doing my PhD 
uh, uh, through a, an aid for developing nation on the most boring topic on the planet is to find water in the desert. I mean, I come from a desert. I was born in one. And so an international agency gave me, gave me some money to study water in, in the deserts. And uh, uh, that was in 1998. And I was so lucky in 1998 that uh, the uh, the mission, European mission, that was called at that time Mars 69, exploded on the launch pad. And they were looking for people to help uh, to find a new technology in the next Mars mission, which was called Mars Express, to look for, wa for water on Mars. So I was expert in looking for water on the desert. When I did my presentation in my second year of my PhD, somebody from the European Space Agency, which was there, said, this is great, but everything you do is perfect, but we need to do this on another planet. We need to use this radar technology to look for water on Mars. And that was the Mars Express mission. I worked on the Mars instrument. I did my PhD on that with the Netlander instrument also. And then from that, the, the Mars exploration has picked up a lot. And they needed people who are experts in, in desert environment. And that's how I jumped into the put dock in NASA in 2004. And, uh, and from there to JTL and uh, from there to every mission I've been. So I would say that space, space exploration also is one of the fields who are very open for an international way. Of course, there are regulations, the ITA rule, but it's one of the most uh, uh, diversified team. Uh, my advisors were from France, from Germany, from the US, uh, from Italy. Um, and, and I think people who share the passion for space, they look to wherever you come from Earth, you're coming from that spot. That's it. I mean, they don't see the difference between where is Egypt is and where the US is. Our planet is just a small body in the solar system and we are all on, on it. So they have less tendency to look to questions like religion, background, and citizenship, and help you as a human. And I really appreciate that in space field a lot. And I'll um, kind of add to that a little bit. Uh, so one of my, the hats that I wear is a meteoriticist. So I specialize in meteorites. And um, yes. those are rocks from outer space. So you want to touch an asteroid, you want to touch the moon, you want to touch Mars, get a meteorite. So that's doing Earth science um on rocks from other planetary bodies anyway there's a uh international organization called the meteoritical society that offers um discounted and oftentimes heavily discounted membership rates and travel grants to go attend meetings so a lot of different um space uh related societies will offer opportunities for students from some of these countries at a very deep discount to come attend those meetings. So I would recommend looking at those websites and seeing if there's any of those funds that you might um, uh, be be qualified for. So uh, there was another question in the Q&A that I think is directed towards Mark. Um, I'm not sure if you can read the Q&A, but it says in there, can you explain how you deploy payloads through pipelines? And what is the maximum weight you can deploy? Does that? Yeah, sure. And okay. Uh, in fact, right behind me, I uh, <laughs> I keep changing my background from uh, underground rock breaking to to our space flight. So uh, we encapsulate in um, in a, what's we called uh, a TAV, a trans atmospheric vehicle, which you see that slender body, and uh, and then it opens up, and there is a very small. Uh, two-stage liquid-fueled rocket that goes off. It's a, it's a mass-produced system. And so your payload uh, goes up very much like a traditional small satellite uh, type payload with a clamp band interface uh, or um, a, a small satellite dispenser, CubeSat dispenser. So um, it, it looks and feels, uh, except we just integrate things faster and it travels inside this very nice protected cocoon, which has mass uh, that carries it uh, basically gently through the atmosphere and then opens up once there's no atmosphere, you then inject into your final orbit, just like a, just like a standard rocket. You just didn't have that big, long, big rocket. You, you came out of the ground um, with it. And we just have a subterranean um, 
you know, payload uh, loading facility. And did, sorry if I missed it, but did you meant to mention the maximum weight that you're able to take? Oh, uh, right now our target for cargo is 200 kilograms. Uh, we're capable of, the system's capable of being scaled to one ton uh, units or higher. But right now, our entry to market over the next few years will be the 200 kilogram uh, mid satellite market and and kind of repetitive cargo. Uh, with our systems, we'll be able to deliver more cargo to orbit than any other system annually. And what sorts of um, things do the satellites that are deployed into orbit do? Oh yeah, for it's the same. It might be replacement satellites for um, okay. For any of the constellations, remember today you're getting, um, you know, satellites uh, systems that have thousands, if not tens of thousands, of satellites going up. Starlink's one of them. Um, uh, you know, Amazon's putting up their their. I think it's the Cooper Group. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these big satellites, OneWeb, and if one or five or ten of these satellites uh, go out, you have replacements that they need and. If you understand Moore's law, uh, I worked at Intel for a number of years, every 18 months, the speed of the processor doubles. And that means all your technology you just put in the sky 18 to 24 months ago is now obsolete. So it is time to replenish and rebuild. And in the event that uh, you know we have excess capacity, which we will, uh, we start depoting and putting up water and fuel and uh, materials to 3D print. So we're putting those meteors back into the sky so we can do something with them up there. And then later we'll go, we'll talk about leaving and lassoing that technology, uh, you know, from asteroids. Okay. Or right now, yeah, just delivery, cargo, anything. Um, I see another question that came across that's kind of related to something we talked about earlier. It's asking about um, for a graduate earth science student, if they're wanting to get into this planetary exploration or um, planetary science, what sort of tangential skill sets should they uh, have to be most competitive in that market? So uh, I would think electrical engineering. Today, uh, about half of the observations are made with radar and microwave. I mean, I would say for Earth and for planet. Uh, the other half is optical and uh, and uh, and hyperspectral and uh, some neutron uh, uh, detectors, but but really being able to do signal analysis and image processing uh, and uh, statistical skills uh, and numerical modeling. So basically, any Earth scientist of the future need to be an Earth scientist and a computer computer scientist too. Both in one. So if there is a, a major that I would recommend in addition to earth science would be definitely computer science or electrical engineering. Yeah. Um, I'd yeah. Echo I'm an aero astro engineer and I totally s s second SOM. Computer science and double E is a great place to start. Yeah. And I would echo with specific um, programs. Yeah, knowing coding, but being able to work with ArcGIS or uh, there's an image processing program that a lot of folks that I've worked with in remote sensing use called IDL. That's mm -hmm. a very uh, attractive thing to people having that experience. Um, I would add to that the, the things as an earth science student, what you'd want to, to have under your belt to get into planetary exploration collaborating with engineers and physicists because that is a necessity in the space exploration field is working like we've talked about several times on this um on this panel working with uh, folks with a diverse background so maybe taking a few classes in engineering or physics if you don't have any um, or having some experiences that increase that collaboration i think can pay dividends in the future I agree with you. I think what's important is that you've trained your trained your mind in a discipline and that you've learned how to learn. And whether it's, you know, uh, planetary science or it's computer programming or it's business uh, that you've gone through, you've got yourself to a point where you can sit down and learn anything. I left Blue Origin. I had not spent a minute in the mining business, uh, even though I'm a third generation miner. I left, came back. 
and I deployed some very complex sensors underground. We actually used grav survey tools that only the oil and gas and planetary scientists used. And we did so in a mining, first time to do it in mining. And we were able to detect a huge ore body with one single drill hole. And that took a lot for me to understand. In fact, I had to go learn ArcGIS. I had to go map and I get a full appreciation of how now we can apply machine learning AI to things that it took me a good five, six years to go from being an aerospace engineer into actually being very capable of talking about geophysics. And it's just at least you have the background to then learn how to learn. And so I just recommend pick a discipline and then, yes, go try some classes, like you said, uh, of areas you want to seek out. Um, I'll give an opportunity here if either of the panelists had a question for each other or thought we uh, should go over something that maybe we we have not. Does anyone have any? Well, I do. I do. Go I have. So we're getting ready at Pipeline to to fly a lot. And in fact, what we do is we'll take payloads for anybody uh, to try different things. We're going to fly out, likely out of Spaceport America, uh, like we've done in the past, and repetitively. Ideally, we'll collect your your sample. Uh, but uh, we love to hear from you on what things you'd like to fly. And they're small form factor. These are. You know, just things that would be 10 millimeters in diameter, maybe 20, 30, 50 millimeters long. It's little small cylinders, but we would pack them and then recover. So I'd love to hear from anybody who wants to try things. Um, so it's even a, a nano cube sat a standard or cylinder sat standard, something. Love to hear from you, Isam. Andrew, you want to throw some meteorites back into the sky? Sure. Collect them again. <laughs> you tell me. So, Mark, so, uh, Mark, Mark, I think... Uh, uh, I'm very excited. I was very hopeful to see the video, actually. Your, your video, if we can see it, that would be great. And I think we should have a chat one day about uh, uh, low Earth orbit uh, 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 insertion with your company because there's a lot of potential, uh, sp especially for groundwater mapping, uh, mm -hmm. using low Earth orbits, VHF sounding radar. And so, uh, and these are made on mini sats, and uh, the launch is a big expense actually, and they can only stay in space for a couple of years. So, if we have a cheap way to replenish these in space, that would be really a great advantage. <laughs> well, you got your wish. I'm sharing my screen. I don't know if anyone can yeah. see it, but here's the we video. <laughs> so, if we I don't know if you can hear it. Space, yeah, we can. Yes. Putting a satellite into space can cost tens of thousands to millions, and there's a wait list for years. Pipeline to Space has developed a new hypersonic launch system to deliver cargo that will endlessly fill the supply chain to space. I'm Mark Russell. I'm an aerospace engineer, and I'm founder and CEO of both Pipeline to Space and... Sorry, right, I kind of dropped it there, but... Uh... All right. Companies are revolutionizing access to space. Hi, I'm Greg Seymour. I'm a co-founder of Pipeline of Space. I'm also an aerospace engineer with over 35 years. And Greg was chief architect at Blue Origin. At Pipeline of Space, placing that first stage booster with a ground system filled with propellant that's able to propel a space-bound vehicle through the propellant and through the ground infrastructure and emerge at hypersonic velocities. From there, we have a small liquid rocket that takes it to the rest of the space. We eliminate entirely the big first stage booster and change the entire paradigm for safe, low cost, on demand space launch from land or sea. With the global space economy's value predicted to top one trillion. Well, I don't want to spend, take all the time, but that's uh, that's what we do. And we use small versions of that to break rock uh, in the ground. So we're, we're really okay. good at finding things fast. But uh, Well, thanks. For, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, <laughs> always, always happy to. It, it was a bit dichotomous for me to leave spa uh, space company, go into underground, but knowing the long-term vision was intact. And that took me, you know, a decade plus to get both the underground tech and you know, understand geophysics and ge you know geology as well as uh, now we're poised to build big long tunnels that launch things uh, and eventually um, we'll call it lower G uh, capable payloads. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, but thank you, Assam and Mark, for attending today, and uh, thanks for this great conversation. 
and I well, hope to see you all again soon. Yeah, uh, go ahead and, and uh, if anybody wants to, just hit me at Mark uh, Pipeline to Space. Uh, dot com and or please you know reach out to andrew and his um uh, they know how to uh, get to me so thanks right. so much yep i'll see y'all okay Bye. take care